Hi, um, welcome everyone. We are running a bit late. We're going to wait for a couple more minutes to see if all the people that registered to the webinar um, actually show up. <laughs> um, so then be patient for another couple of minutes. Well, we are going to start now. So then, um, welcome everybody to the third webinar from the Theru Therfa um, Association. These are the associations for um, Spanish scientists in the UK and Germany, re respectively. And today's webinar is entitled Exploring Life Under the Sea, Current Challenges. So since the webcams are not working, then you cannot really see me. At least you can picture me somehow with that. Um, with that photo. Um, so then let me introduce myself. I'm Marta Moyano. I work on larval fish ecology at the University of Hamburg and I moved here something like uh, two years ago after I finished, well, almost three now, um, after I finished my PhD in the Canary Islands. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this uh, go-to webinar platform, so then um, I would like to give you a couple of useful tips. Uh, because please remember that this webinar is interactive, meaning that you can always ask questions, either raising, raising your hand, and I think you can see the pointer on, in the presentation now here. So then on the left uh, picture that is showing the panel that it should be seen right now, um, you have this icon here that you can press, and then I will see that um, you have raised your hand and that you want to ask something. Um, in that case, I can um, pass you the voice, so then you can we can hear you out loud what you ask your question. Um, in case you're a little bit more shy and you prefer to just ask a question typing, you can also do that in the um, in this question tab that is also on the bottom of your panel. Okay. Okay. So then we can already start the webinar uh, before. We move on to the speakers. I would like to give you a brief introduction of why we came up with the idea of running this webinar. This, uh, webinar. Uh, one can say that the birth of the oceanography occurred one Saturday morning in 1872 uh, when the Challenger research vessel departed from England. This expedition was hugely successful. It expanded our understandings on the ocean's chemistry, on bottom topography, and also they described more than 4,500 species that were new to science. But in any case, a lot of things have changed since that expedition, and now we count with well-equipped vessels that allow us to survey all oceans without actually risking our lives. That were what these people were doing in the 
um, in the past. This also means that new technologies are now available from um, CTD rosettes compared to the other water samplings that they were using in the Challenger or other types of improved nets as these ones that we can see in the picture. Also satellite images and are extremely useful in today's studies to measure, for example, the sea surface temperature and salinity while we are just sitting in front of our computer just right now. Also all the um, and genetics and genomics and all the omics um, science are greatly um, improving marine science. Together with that, there's a lot of um, marine ROVs and other type of high-tech instruments that let us study small organisms in situ, so underwater, using cameras and a wide variety of sensors. But in addition to technological advances, there is a special emphasis that is given to interdisciplinary studies, which involve all sorts of science, like chemistry, physics, microbiology, genetics, and, and so on, so on, so on. So, taking into account all these uh, advances in marine science, we could name, for example, some of the hot topics which are currently receiving much attention. I've written here just a bunch of them, um, like, for example, impact of climate-driven changes and ocean acidification um, on the water itself and then on the species living in the seas, um, improvement of fish, fishing years to reduce by catch, and uh, another topic that is currently um, receiving a lot of attention is how to um, change from single species management to an ecosystem-based management in which we try to um, assess and manage all the ecosystem together. Um, but today, our three speakers are going to focus on the first of these two points, providing a general background to each problem and explaining how they are willing or how they are trying to shed some light on these different topics with the research they are currently doing. So then, let me introduce you the three speakers that we have today. Uh, we will start with Edna Kinan, which is a postdoc fellow at the, uh, the University of Southampton, and the title of her talk is Arctic Ocean Meltdown, Monitoring Ocean Acidification in a Changing Environment. Then we have um, Klaas Muller, which is a postdoc fellow at the Institute of Agrobiology and Fisheries Science in Hamburg, Germany. Um, and his, title, his uh, talk is entitled Small Organism with a Big Impact, How Modern Optical Sampling Methods Increase Our Understanding Also on, of Surplanet and Ecology. And thirdly, we have Juan Santos, which is a research fellow at the Tunen Institute in Rostock, Germany. And his talk is entitled Development and Testing of the Fresh Wind, a Flat, flat Fish Reduction Device for the Baltic Sea Troll Fishery. So, I think we can already start with the presentation from Edna. Um, so I'm really glad to introduce you to her. Then let me see if I can easily change the screen and give her the word. OK, hello. Yeah, perfectly. Yeah. We hear you can you. see my screen now? Yep, but it's okay. not full screen yet. Uh, it's not full. Oh, I need to put it on now. Mm -hmm. There we go. Perfect. Okay. Good. All right. So, um, hello, everybody, and thanks, Marta, for the introduction. Um, so, as Marta said, I'm working at the National Oceanography Center in Southampton. And what I want to talk to you about today is um, ocean acidification and looking at it more in the terms of biogeochemistry. So the work I focus on is mainly in the Arctic Ocean. So what I, what I kind of want you to, to um, my aim of today is that you can leave with an understanding of what the main challenges are in trying to study ocean acidification in this environment today, which is, I think you all know, changing very, very quickly. And there's lots of <clears throat> very interesting things happening there. So what I'm going to um, very quickly do, the structure of my talk is just going to introduce ocean acidification to those of you that are not familiar with it and kind of um, just also tell you a little bit about why the Arctic Ocean is a hotspot for this topic and then take you through the challenges in trying to monitor this ocean acidification and understanding what's causing it in the Arctic Ocean. 
So first of all, so what is um, ocean acidification? So just let me put this away. Can't see. There we go. So ocean acidification is we have the oceans here, and they take up about a quarter of the atmospheric CO2, as you can see here. And so this is a this is just a, a simple physical chemical reaction that occurs. So the CO2 gas is dissolved in the ocean. But in the oceans, we have what we call the carbonate system. And the carbonate system is sort of what you see on this slide is a series of uh, reactions from different species that acts as a buffer to mitigate that um, uptake of CO2. So when that CO2 is dissolved in the water, it, it forms carbonic, carbonic acid. So then that carbonic acid quite uh, quickly dissociates into these bicarbonate ions and the hydrogen ions. Okay, there's something not happening. Yeah, it's working now. Sorry. <laughs> um, so these hydrogen ions are what make the water more acidic. So the higher the concentration of hydrogen ions, the lower the lower our pH is. So the more acidic the water is. So what then also happens, we have a second reaction, which is that the bicarbonate ions also further dissociate into carbonate ions giving out another proton, another hydrogen ion, again making the water more acidic. However, because this is an equilibrium reaction, when there's a lot of these hydrogen ions, the carbonate ions then come up and soak up those protons, shifting this equilibrium towards the left. And then, so somewhat buffer this, um, this reaction that are causing the water more acidic, so it's acting as a buffer. And uh, so as you can see, it's, this is quite a, a fine balance that's occurring in the oceans, and this has been going on for many, many, many years. So what's happening now is that we're pumping all this anthropogenic CO2 into the atmosphere at quite um, a fast rate. And in fact, um, this year, earlier on in May, we in Mauna Loa in Hawaii, in the atmospheric observatory there, we reached 400 ppm. So that's a really, really high um, atmospheric concentration. And what you can see here on this graph is how this uh, atmospheric CO2, CO2 has been rising from about 320 when we started records in the 50s to, well, this is not the most actual curve, but to 400 ppm that was reach, reached this year. So what is happening is that since that ocean is taking up about a quarter of that um, atmospheric CO2, it's also increasing. The upper ocean, as you can see here, these are three different time series from different areas in the global ocean. These are also increasing at the same rate. And because of the reactions I just described to you, this results in a, dis in a decrease in this pH. So for example, taking this sort of medium green one, you can see from 1990s decreased from 8.12 pH to about 8.07 in 2010. So since pH is a logarithmic scale, this is a really important decrease in pH that's occurring at the moment. So what does this all mean? So this is sort of the biogeochemistry, the chemistry really that's occurring in the water. So what does all this mean to marine life? So there are some direct effects that we can we can see on this. So the two main ones I've just listed here. So the um, growth is affected. So it's thought um, that at, especially at early life stages, so when the larvae, when they're um, subject to these more acidic waters, and they they don't um, grow as quickly or as well. And also, um, shell formation is the other aspect of um, organisms that's been affected. So if you think of this, the mollusks use um, calcium carbonate to form their shells. So we, they need that carbonate ion that we were talking about earlier on. So we're decreasing the concentrations of that carbonate ion. Effectively, these organisms cannot um, build their shells. So here I've just shown you two photos. These are um, of two organisms, and I want to what I want to highlight here is that they're all um, affected in a different way. So, for example, theropods, which are really microscopic um, snails, they're formed. You can see this is really pretty, and you can see this really really fine shell of calcium carbonate around them. And there's already some evidence that theropods are dissolving under current conditions because they don't have enough carbonate ion to form these shells. So this is a negative impact. However, there are also some positive impacts. For example, seagrasses, they use CO2 um, to make photosynthesis to, and to grow. So they're actually responding positively to this. So 
you know, this I just wanted to show you this to kind of highlight that it's quite a complex response that we're seeing and lots of different individuals, but, but really what we need to think about is the whole ecosystem level that Marta was talking about in the introduction and how we need to move from single species to ecosystems. And here, for example, you see whales here in this um, picture of an uh, Arctic ecosystem are not thought to be directly impacted by ocean acidification. However, if their food supply, which can be these terrible at the bottom of the food chain, when we have these terrapods that are, are being affected by ocean acidification. So how is that going to impact the whales who are, it's going to have an indirect impact? And in the Arctic, where the food webs are very simple, this, um, these effects can propagate very, very fast to the higher trophic levels. Oops. So this is happening at a global scale. So why is the ocean, the Arctic Ocean, important? Why is it a hot, uh, why is it a, a hot spot for this ocean acidification? Well, here you have a very simple graph of the solubility of CO2 here against the temperature. So you see, as we reduce this temperature, we get an increased solubility. So the Arctic waters, which are here cold, CO2 dissolves more readily in them than, for example, the tropical waters that are 2025 or so CO2 is more soluble in cold polar water. So this is true for the Arctic Ocean and for the Southern Ocean. But there is a second factor that is also very important that we need to take into account, and that's the buffer capacity. So here I have um, plotted the two polar oceans, so the Southern Ocean and the Arctic Ocean, and I've plotted total alkalinity, which is a way of measuring, another way of kind of measuring this buffer capacity. So I've plotted on the same color scale, so you see the difference. So alkalinity from 2000 to 2400 for both, and you can see the red and the yellows predominate in the Southern Ocean, which are higher values, whereas we get lower values in the Arctic Ocean. So the, the Arctic Ocean, apart from that, um, more higher solubility of CO2 also has this very low buffering capacity. So when we combine these two factors together, what we get is a very vulnerable um, area of the oceans, very vulnerable to ocean acidification. So what you have here is a, um, a projection made by Steinacker and colleagues in 2009. And what this is, is the, what's called the calcium carbonate saturation state, uh, which is this omega here. It's basically the solubility product of calcium and, car and carbonate ions. So anything above one means that uh, the waters are super saturated in, in calcium carbonate, so the organisms can, can make their shells. However, if the saturation state is below one, this means it's under saturation and it's under saturated and that's going to dissolve these organisms. So in this study, what they found is that by the year 2100, they were going to, that the Arctic Ocean would be under, fully under saturated with um, of, of calcium carbonate. Um, so this is really, really, um, this is why the Arctic Ocean is really um, susceptible to ocean acidification. So now that we know that, um, what are the main challenges in monitoring this ocean acidification in, in the Arctic Ocean? Well, I think the first one and most obvious is the fact that it's a very remote area and there's sea ice there, so it's difficult to get to. It's dark six months of the year, there's bad weather. So this results in the fact that it's largely undersampled. So when you compare these global data sets, for example, from the Atlantic Ocean, where we have all these nice north-south, east-west transects, most of the areas are fully covered. When you come to the Arctic Ocean, with the exception of the Nordic Seas, you can see there's very large gaps here. Um, yes. So how do we, not typically, how do we, um, carry out science in the Arctic Ocean. Well, the, the, the way, most typical way is doing this on um, science cruises dedicated for this. So for example, this is a photo of the James Clark Cross, um, which is the British polar ship. So, you know, you can go out on this ship and go, get onto the ice and then you can go and collect the water. You can make a hole, collect water from it, put down your niskins, put down your CTDs to get profiles. If you're interested in getting ice cores from the ice to look at the, what's happening with the ice, you can do that. And furthermore, if you want to get samples from just right under the ice, you can cut out a hole and dive and collect the samples there. 
So this is all. This is um. This is really fun and really exciting, but it's really not the most cost-effective way of doing science because you have to send this ship out there, which costs a lot of money, the people, the instruments, and yet when you get all this data, you it's only a few weeks from this very specific area. So what we really want to move towards is these autonomous measurements in monitoring. In a way, this is really the key and where we need to go. So. So there, this is a photo of an ice mooring. So you put your ice mooring in there, and you have your profiler which goes up and down. So it can, with these sensors mounted on it. So every few hours you can take a profile, or whatever you want. And this has the advantage that you then have continuous monitoring of what's going on, and you can just go put your mooring on. Generally, leave them there for a year, come back the next year, and you get all your data. You've got like a whole years of data, and it's much more cost effective than just sending out lots of ships out there. So this is already done for like physical properties. However, for ocean acidification, there's no such thing really as carbonate sensors. We don't have anything that can measure carbonate chemistry properly. So this is where we need to move on to. And for that, I just want to show you some work that's done here by one of our colleagues, by Victoire Herold. And she's been working on developing this microsensor, um, which is based on microfluidics. So this is the chip she mounts her sensor on. And uh, the idea is that this sensor can then be put on, can be completely autonomous, put on a mooring, as I just showed you on the previous slide. So at the moment, this is at the stage where it's a shipboard system. So it can go on a ship, and it can take in C2 measurements every few minutes. So it has very, very high resolution. So it's, what you can see here is a map from a cruise we went on um, last year, and there you can see um, really, really high resolution of all the data that we were collecting every few minutes. But what you also see here is all these gaps in the data, so it still needs to be serviced and calibrated. So the next step would be to make this fully autonomous. So then, before I move on to the next slide, just to highlight this on this slide, how you see the very sharp gradient in this and this pH. So that brings me to the next challenge, which is understanding this variability. Where's all this variability coming from? How can we quantify it? So just very quickly go through this slide. This is a simplified slide of what's happening in, in the ocean. So we have CO2 here. And as I said, we can, uh, between the atmosphere and the ocean, causes acid, ocean acidification. At the same time, it causes global warming, which causes all these uh, changes in the environment, which can also affect directly cause ocean acidification, but it can also affect all these biogeochemical processes and then these feedbacks to the atmosphere. So just basically get the idea that there's all these processes happening and they're all interacting with each other. So we can't just focus on one single thing. This I'm going to skip. Um, so this, so for that, I just want to show you a study that we did um, in the Atlantic Gateway of the Arctic Ocean. So this is here between Norway and Svalbard. This is where all the Atlantic waters come into the Arctic Ocean, whereas here in the Bering Strait, this is the uh, Pacific Gateway here. So what we did is we tried to look at this variability in terms of um, uh, both space and time. So this one first is looking at the seasonality of it. So what we saw is this is the um, omega, so the calcium carbonate saturation states, and these are the different seasons that we went out and collected the data. And what you see very clearly is you get this peak in spring and summer in saturation states, and that's because we're getting um, primary productivity, which is enhancing these saturation states, and then they decrease in autumn and in winter. So just from looking at this slide, what you see very clearly is that most of the research cruises take place in summer. So when we go out in summer to collect this data, we're we'll just getting this top of the picture. So we're not really seeing what's happening in winter when those saturation states are down. So it could be more corrosive for these organisms. So really, this just makes even more the case that we need to move um, to more autonomous systems. So then what we also tried to do is understand what all those processes that I was showing you on the other slide um, are causing. What are what processes are causing these seasonal changes. So here we just broke down um, the observed changes, which are here in gray, into different, into different processes. So I'll just tell you that biology, we found biology to be the main driver of these seasonal changes. We control between 45 and 70% of it. So the 
So since we've seen this cycle now, what we need to think about is how is this going to change with changes that are occurring at the moment in the Arctic Ocean, how the physical changes and the biological changes will, will affect this cycle. So for example, since primary production is thought to be increasing, does this mean that it's going to increase the, the seasonal change here because the blooms might but the blooms might occur just earlier, but not be more intense. So it could just be a shift rather than an increase. So these are things that need to be studied at the moment. So then just another, some of an, our work that we're currently doing. So these are two cruises we were on also in the Fram Strait, which is also just beside the Atlantic Gateway that I was showing you. And this in white, you can see the shaded areas where the sea ice is. So here I have plotted the omega, so the calcium carbonate saturation states here, against the the first the top 100 meters of this area. So I've divided it in two areas, so the sea ice influenced area and the ice free area. So in blue you can see that sea ice area and ice free area. And what you see is a very striking difference in the saturation states and a very large range you see in the surface waters of 2.1 for the saturation states. So, you know, we want to try and understand what, what's causing those big differences. So another way to plot this is, again, just omega with the depth and in color I've put the apparent oxygen utilization, so it's the consumption of, of oxygen. So when AOU is positive, this means there's respiration. So this is increasing our inorganic carbon and it's decreasing our saturation states, whereas when we have negative values, um, there's primary production going on and this this takes up the CO2 that's in the ocean and raises the saturation states. You can see a very general trend of a positive AOU and negative AOU um, at either side of the Fram Strait. So here I've just highlighted so this station here which is on the sea as you can see the this, this decrease because of this respiration and this enhancement here because of the photosynthesis. However, we also have this station here, which is, for example, in the middle, and you can see this has negative AOU, so there is photosynthesis happening, but why is it not enhanced as much and as in these areas over here? So that's just explained in the next slide, and it's really very simple. It's, you can see here the blue one, which is the one under the ice, and the one outside the ice. So this is the omega, the calcium carbonate saturation state plotted against nitrate and the salinity. So basically what's happening, primary production is increasing our saturation states as we use up the nitrate. However, on this side here, since we have ice melt that actually dilutes our saturation states and what we get is an, a, a non, apparently a not an effect with the nitrate, not a decrease, not an increase in the omega with the nitrate. And then just to put that into another some context is that on the other side of the Arctic Ocean, on the western side, in the Canada Basin, this is some work done by the Americans, again you have the sea ice and what you see here is that these areas which here in winter is fully covered by ice, so the ice has retreated at this point and what you see is that there's under really under saturation here in these areas where the sea ice has melted. And so less than one where we didn't see that on the other side of, we saw values I think 1.5 um, on average. So what's happening in the Canada Basin is that there's no primary production or very low primary productivity so it doesn't counteract that sea ice melt, not in the way I showed you on the previous slide. So sea ice is really important. Biology doesn't have a dominant control here. So this is just to show you then that there's, there can be some differences, not just all down to one factor. So with that, just to finish, because I think I've gone, maybe gone a bit over time. So just um, <laughs> tell you that there's, um, you know, that there's, I think the main two messages that I want to leave you today is that we need autonomous systems to be able to measure this and that understanding the processes has to be done, like what I say here in the last one, we need to look at the whole picture so that there's not just one factor causing the situation of modification. So thank you, and I don't know if we have time for questions, sorry. <laughs> um. Hi, um, thanks a lot for the presentation. We actually have one question that um, um, I think we can give the word to Mar. Now you should be able to talk. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. 
Yeah, great. Okay. So thank you very much for your talk. I'll just have a very quick question. You probably made the point earlier, but I don't, didn't get it right. So um, why is the Arctic more sensitive to ocean acidification than the Southern Ocean? What is the main difference between yep. the two poles? Yep. So this is, if I can quickly, I don't know if you can still see my slides or maybe yep. not. Yep. Um, yeah. So, oops. So basically it's, it's the buffer capacity. So if you see in this slide here, um, so alkalinity is a way of measuring the buffer capacity. So the Southern Ocean has much higher alkalinity than the Southern, than the Arctic Ocean. So the system is better buffered. But, so but why is that? Why because does it, it have a, a lower capacity in comparison to the other pole. Why does the why does the Southern Ocean have a, a higher alkalinity? Is that what you're asking hmm. me? Yep. So there's, there's all these processes, I don't have a straight answer right now, but basically one of the reasons is there's some upwelling. So the water comes, the water is coming up with higher alkalinity up into the Southern Ocean, whereas we don't see that here. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> I hope that answers your question. Okay, then since we are running a little bit late, I think I'm going to give uh, the word straight to class. Um, then that should make it. No, that's me. Um, yeah, there you go then. So now we are moving one level up in the trophic level, in the trophic system. And so class, whenever you want to yes. start. Okay. So welcome to the second part of this webinar, and uh, thank you for tuning in. So my name is Marta, already said, is Klaus Möller, and I'm working at the University of Hamburg. And the title of my presentation here is uh, Small Organisms with a Big Impact, How Modern Optical Sampling Methods Can Help to Increase Our Understanding of Zooplankton Ecology. And to be a little bit more specific, um, especially how optical sampling methods can help us to resolve the distribution patterns and behavior of these organisms. So, um, plankton um, is um, the, the base, serves as the productive base for aquatic ecosystems and plays a major role in oceanic food webs and also has an important impact on the ocean's carbon cycle. And due to these facts, it's necessary to understand the processes which control the spatial and also temporal distribution of these organisms. And uh, however, so resolving this distribution is particularly challenging since aquatic ecosystems are characterized by an immense variability of biotic and abiotic factors on spatial and uh, also temporal scales reaching from migrants to uh, far more than thousands of kilometers. And uh, recent advances in imaging technology have led to the development of uh, so-called new optical sampling devices and one of them is the video plankton recorder or short abbreviated uh, VPR I'm working with. And these optical instruments allow a high resolution observation of plankton on very small and spatial scales over long distances and time periods compared to the limited traditional methods like, for example, net sampling. And uh, furthermore, this non-invasive method also allows sampling of very fragile plankton organisms and particles like uh, also gelatinous organisms, for example, this jellyfish, which you can see on this image here from the VPR, and also marine snow, which are aggregates of biogenic origin, like detritus. And so the focus and motivation of my work is to elucidate and to resolve the underlying mechanisms um, of small-scale distribution patterns using an optical sampling approach by using this uh, video plankton recorder. So, um, what are the potential mechanisms influencing the distribution and behavior? So it is known that marine zooplankton organisms perform a wide variety of motility patterns, including active swimming, passive sinking, escape jumps, as well as diurnal vertical migrations. And these movements are behavioral responses to different biological and also physical environmental conditions. For instance, encounter rates with other individuals, light, turbulence, and food. So in these different distribution patterns and behaviors are shown in this little animation where you can see that turbulence here starts to um, affect close to the surface and um, also in the deeper water layers in a different way. So 
some of the organisms also perform, as mentioned, diurnal vertical migration. They're moving up and down, while some uh, stay in the deep waters over the whole time. And finally, also random movements can occur in the water column, and uh, as well as thin layer formations, which is plankton or particle aggregation in a very narrow vertical layer. So, um, however, assembling these different distribution and behavior patterns is especially challenging since sampling in the marine environment is kind of blind sampling, as you can imagine from this slide where you have this ship on the ocean surface. And uh, so compared to sampling in a terrestrial environment um, where you can often sit, wait, and for example, count the number or observe the behavior of animals. So, and at the end of the 19th century, Victor Hansen, uh, a pioneering zooplanktologist, posed two fundamental questions, um, which were, what are the numbers and kinds of things in the sea at a given time and place? And second, how does this material vary from season to season, year to year? And today, these are still the, basically the same questions that we are trying to attempt and to answer. So, and... Um, one reason for that is the limited information of the so-called traditional sampling instruments in our, which we have in our toolbox, which, uh, for example, include non-opening -open closing nets like the bongo net with the two mouth, mouth openings in the upper right panel, and then also opening closing nets like the WP2, which can be closed with a weight, so we can uh, deploy to a certain depth and then just uh, Lower weight and it's getting closed in a certain depth, and then also multi opening uh, and closing nets like the mock nets on the right panel, which have several nets that can be closed then in a certain depth, as well as also pumps and particle counters. So, um, one problem is that net sampling only represents single geographic point samples, like in the upper panel, where sampling with a bongo net is illustrated, which is behind the research vessel, here the, the green one, and uh, you can see that it misses most of the plankton patches, which are here represented by the red circles and aggregated at a density gradient in the water column. So this would hence lead to an underestimation of the abundance of the organisms. And furthermore, multiple opening and also closing nets, as shown in the lower panel, don't have the potential to resolve these thin layers, for example, since patches might potentially be averaged out due to the coarse vertical um, resolution and limited tow time of the nets. And additionally, processing of the collected samples is very time consuming and expensive since they are fixate, uh, fixated in formaldehyde and need to be manually sorted under the microscope, which can take sometimes years until you get the results. And so, to overcome this limitation, um, recent technical advances have led to the development of uh, two-dimensional optical sampling instruments like the video plankton recorder. And here on the upper left panel, you see a picture of it during the deployment from a research vessel. And the VPR can be seen as an underwater microscope, which is towed behind the, behind the research vessel. And it is equipped with a high-resolution digital camera and a suit of different environmental sensors, including a CPD and also turbidity, fluorescence, and light sensors. So, and the images are taken directly between the camera and the scope of this instrument with 25 frames per second. So a huge number of images are then sent in real time via a fiber optic tow cable connection on board and are there combined with the hydrographic data from the different sensors. So, um, you can choose between four different magnifications, between 7 times 7 up to 42 times 42 millimeter, which is suitable to capture these small mesozooplankton organisms, as well as also bigger macrozooplankton up to fish larvae. And the camera is mounted below a V-fin and continuously undulated between the surface and the bottom to obtain data from the whole water column. So, here you can see some, some nice example um, images, so very nice ones from a cruise in the North Atlantic, including on the upper left the red tinophore, which is a gelatinous organism, also puppet pods, one of the most abundant uh, organisms on Earth, and uh, also females with an egg sac, and we have an euphorcid in the lower right, and also an arrow worm, a ketogenite in the middle. 
So, and uh, since you end up with several hundred thousands of these images, a random subset um, of the obtained images are manually sorted into a separate taxa or categ categories and um, a so-called training set, which is then afterwards used to classify all sampled images automatically and uh, which is then increasing the speed of the data analysis compared to the net sampling. And however, most of these images only allow an identification into taxonomic groups, but not down to species level. So um, this information you get from the images by when you, when you plot them can be used to create these zoo plankton and particle maps on very small scales, less than meters over hundreds of kilometers, and for for very long time, for, so for many hours up to several days. And on this slide, you can see an example from the Baltic Sea where we sampled along a star-shaped transect for 12 hours. And uh, here we have the depth on the y-axis versus latitude and longitude of the VPR tow track. And the concentration of marine snow aggregates, aggregates is given color-coded. And here, looking at the distribution of marine snow, which can not be sampled with nets due to the fragile nature of these aggregates, we can see clearly a very narrow distribution within a thin layer of aggregates in about 60 meter depth, around about 55 to 60 meter depth. And so now comparing this distribution of copper pots to the marine snow um, distribution along the VPR tow track, we can see very high concentrations of copper pot individuals close to the surface, again color coded, and uh, the red dots there, and uh, also close to the bottom. But there are also very high concentrations within the thin layer of marine snow particles in about 55 um, meter water depth again. And so now, oh, this is now the copper pot concentration. Sorry for that. What you can see here is again the, the very narrow thin layer in 55 meter depth. And so now looking uh, and unfolding the tow track and looking at the distribution over time, the picture gets even clearer. So here, fine scale sampling with the VPR revealed a very dense thin layer of marine snow aggregates at the density gradient, which we know from our sensors, between uh, 50 and 55 meter depth, which is apparent in this contour plot of the 11 hour long tow track corresponding to a total distance of 115 kilo kilometers. So um, we also took net samples before and after the VPR deployment for reasons of ground truthing and species information, information, which cannot be obtained from the VPR as mentioned. And uh, a comparison of the copper pot abundance reveals more than twofold higher um, um, abundances obtained with the VPR. So differences between the two years are probably due to different sampling efficiencies for earlier copepodate stages, so smaller organisms um, during the development as well as smaller copper pot species, which are typically underrepresented in net samples due to net extrusion, but also due to uh, net avoidance. And the highest sampling resolution of the VPR in one meter bins uh, compared to the 10 meter vertical bins here from the multi-net show um, clearly that this VPR sampling was critical for resolving the vertical thin layer, um, here shown by the red dotted line. And um, so clearly the net sampling was, was not able to resolve the pronounced small scale abundance peak in the halo prime, which was only visible in the VPR data and is probably averaged out between these two nets over here. So however, the strength of the multi-net is to provide abundance information at the species level, which can be used to uh, support the VPR data. And the multi-net samples allow the clear attribution of the dominant pot species to the layers of the high copper pot abundance observed with the VPR. So, but I don't want to go too much into detail here. So, finally, we were also able to identify behavioral responses with um, this camera system of copper pots. And a portion of the marine snow aggregates, um, marine snow aggregate images obtained with the VPR showed copper pots directly attached to the aggregates and suggesting an active feeding behavior. And most of the images that allow species identification show Pseudocalanus acuspis, a very uh, important key species in the Baltic Sea, with its antenna spread to the side and feeding position and suggesting active feeding by copper pots on marine snow. And so, using an optical sampling approach here, 
um, presents really an indirect evidence that marine snow is a viable food, for, a food source for copepods in the deep water layers of the Baltic, which raises uh, then the question if marine snow has been previously undersampled with traditional methods and hence also has been underrated. So uh, to summarize, I want to go quickly go through the pros and cons of optical and traditional sampling methods. So optical sampling, including automatic identification, is the key advantage since the data is natively in an electronic format, as a picture, whereas traditional sample collection requires time consuming and also manual sorting. And in situ optical imaging also has the potential to sample non-destructively which is essential for quantitative sampling of uh, fragile organisms like gelatinous organisms and marine snow, as we have uh, seen here, and forms that are destroyed by traditional sampling methods. So optical imaging also can provide very high spatial and temporal sampling, and this allows a direct comparison with high-resolution environmental data from CTD and other environmental sensors. And another big advantage of optical sampling is real-time data display, allowing for adaptive sampling while the gear is in the water. So by contrast, traditional sampling typically requires months of post-processing. So however, a big disadvantage of optical sampling is that no specimens collected for close-up microscopic analysis or DNA and other biochemical analysis. So um, the optical methods also have a much smaller sampling volume than plankton nets. But given that um, we sample, subsample also the net collections, the discrepancy here is not as big as thought. So overall, our results here show clearly that uh, the potential of optical sampling methods to gain further insights into plankton ecology, but the sampling tool of choice always depends on the objective and the goal of your research. And so with this uh, sentence, I would like to thank you for your attention. Hi, class. Uh, thanks a lot for your for your talk. I, I really enjoyed this kind of automatic um, methodology and all that. Um, I don't see that anyone has a question, okay. but I do have Maybe a couple. We'll... <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. uh, just just um, I will do just one because we are a little bit late. But um, yeah. you were saying that you can have the BPR in the water for hours or days. Did yes. I get that correctly? Yes, right. Okay. So, um, I mean, the, the data is sent via a fiber optic tow cable, but you mm -hmm. also have a power connection. So you are sending power down, and so mm -hmm. you can use transit times of, of research vessels. So when you are doing some, some studies in the, in the polar sea and you want to go back to another harbor or port, for, which takes maybe a couple of days, then you mm -hmm. can just put the, deploy the, the instrument in the water and tow it behind the research vessel and uh, yeah, take images for the whole time, so up to several days. And what is the speed that you will need the boat? I mean, doesn't so, the... So, um, the system I have shown here with the DFIN is not uh, fast enough because mm -hmm. uh, most ships want to go very fast. And so at the moment we are trying to mount this instrument on top of another fast uh, tow body, which can mm -hmm. be go up to 12 knots. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, so depending fast. on the sea state. But uh -huh. then you can really um, go with full speed and yeah, do the sampling underwater. Okay, that's great. Yeah. Great. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> Thanks a lot <laughs> for your answer then. And then um, I think we're going to move on to Kuan now. And then if uh, people have questions, we can just compile them all at the, at the end of the webinar again. Okay, okay so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, Okay, Juan, now you should have, you should be able to, we should hear you. Yeah, now. Hello? Yeah, now you should be Hello. able to. Okay. Yeah, we can um, hear you. Okay. Well, uh, my name is Juan Santos. Um, Wait a second, we cannot see your, we cannot see your screen. Okay. Did you accept the... Is it? Yeah, there it is. Okay. Perfect. Thanks a lot. Yeah. 
Yeah, no problem. As I told before, uh, my name is Juan Santos. I'm working in the Tunian Institute for Baltic Sea Fisheries in Germany. I would like to present uh, um, a study we have uh, carried out during this year about the, develop the development and testing of uh, plastic escapement device for the Baltic Cod trout fishery. You might ask, uh, what means flatfish and what kind of species are flatfish and it's, uh, it, it, it's easy to, to see just looking at the pictures. They are fishes compressed bilaterally uh, with uh, the eyes, as you can see in the central picture, in just one side and they are quite uh, different in many ways to the common ground fishes. And also, I would like to define, to present a bit what, what is the, the what the troll gears are, or how, how they work. They are basically uh, a cone-shaped net which are towed by, by the fishing vessel. So the, the net is connected to the vessel by extremely uh, large bridles, uh, which you can see just here, number three. Uh, device. At the same time, the bridles are connected to the doors. Uh, this is the blue devices here. Uh, the doors are uh, very heavy plates with a specific, special hydrodynamic shape to keep the horizontal uh, spread of, uh, of the combination. And at the same time, the the, the doors are connected to to pivots which are at the same time connected to the vessel. So um, the underlying or the basic uh, fishing process occurring in this uh, with this uh, here is uh, starting when the when the bridles interact with, with the fish fishes uh, which are here in this area. The fishers um, under the approaching bridles reacts. Uh, herding into the central area of the sweeping ground, trying to uh, avoid the contact with the with the approaching bridles and swimming in this area until a certain moment where, when they get tired, start to go back and back, getting into the into the gear through the mouth, which is this area here. This is not to be a very efficient uh, fishing gear, but also in general uh, a low selective gear because all the fishes in this area are vulnerable to, to get into the into the gear. So let's see what happens when the stroll the gear is holded back to the vessel. We got Normally, this is a this is a usual catch structure from a trawler. You can see many colors and many fishes here. That means this is a highly heterogeneous uh, catch profile, composed by both marketable fishes. They are variable. They have quota. Quota, I mean that the. the the volume the fishery can can take and sell into the markets, and they have length class. They have lengths. The, the size, the body size of the fish is above the minimum landing size, which is another legal restriction because undersized species are not allowed to sell in the markets. And in the other side, we have. In this catch profile, we have also it's usual to catch what we know as bycatch, which are non-valuable species or species which are they are valuable but they they have no quota for a certain moment where the fishing is is taking place or undersized individuals. So under such scenario, the crew of the vessel have to take a decision of what to get retained on board for landing, 
based on the fish identification, of course, but also in the trip strategy, strategy on load capacity of the vessel, the fish damage occurred during the fishing process, and so on. So after such sorting process, the catch is split into the landing, landing catch uh, fraction and the discarded catch fraction, which is, as you can see, just uh, the way the fishers just throw back to see uh, the fishes they don't want to land. And this is the problem we face in our, in our group of fishing technology uh, in the Chenin Institute. So, moving on, I would like to give a better definition, a more formal definition of this card, which is basically defined by the FAO, it's the, uh, it's the portion of the catch returned to the sea as a result of economic, legal, or personal consideration. And that means many factors determine the discard practice. Of course, they are perceived by, by, by the industry, but also by the politicians, and by the society as a waste of natural resources. It, uh, it is also, the uh, discards are also a problematic catch because it's common, it's not, it's hidden for, for, for the stock assessment models and produce bias in the prediction of the healthy of stocks, fishing stocks. And all together have been producing increasing concerns in the European Union who in recent times has uh, agreed with, to, to implement uh, this carbon to be applied next year. So this is the this is uh, a new scenario to in, in, uh, in European fisheries to be faced with different strategies to reduce these cuts. There is this, it has been identified that identify different um, strategies and among them I will uh, highlight the, a, a special temporal fishing effort of management of the fisheries uh, being known the structural uh, the, the assemblage of the ecosystems it can be predicted what kind of the species what kind of group of species uh, can be found in a given area for a given season. So this could be used for improve, uh, to reduce the bycatch from, from the fishery, from the industrial fishery. Also, it could be, or it, it's used uh, already real-time closures when in, in fishing areas where uh, endangered species or undersized individuals are present in high concentrations. It is also a strategy to, to improve the markets and to add value for, for bycatch species without value in, in, in the markets, in the common markets. And at the end I would like, of course, to highlight the improvement of fishing gears, which is already what we do. Uh, the improvement of fishing gears can be done in two ways. Uh, improve the size selection of, of the gears by reducing the probability to retain undersized individuals for a given species and also uh, to improve the species selection which is just try to reduce the catches of certain species not interested if, uh, for the fishers. And I would like to move now to, to, to our case of study, which is the, the Baltic cod mixed fishery. This is a, a, a troll fishery here in the Baltic Sea, uh, which produce a discard of uh, component by few species. There is not too much species uh, forming the, 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 catch, the, the discard profile of this fishery. And basically, you can see here the discards are mostly uh, mostly 
uh, the cod, the, the, this long fish, the cod is just the, one of the main species accounted for almost 50% of the of the discarbonate of the fishery, and there is also uh, two, three flat fishes species, which makes up mostly the, the rest of the discard profile. And for cod, the main factor which determines the the discard this round piece species is the is it, its minimum landing size. This is the most valuable species, but it it cannot be landed when the fish has less than 30 centimeters. While the flat fish species, the, the, the discard for for flat fish species is determined by by the market preference. They are not that valuable like the cods in the Baltic harbors, so therefore they are just uh, discarded without uh, a strong effort of its land size. So to date, uh, in the Baltic Sea, uh, most of the research and development of selectivity improvements in the the trawl years has been made to reduce the cut discards, of course, being the most valuable species. And the efforts to reduce the cut discards has been focused mainly in the coden size selection. The coden is the end part of the year, it's a kind of uh, blind netting, of course, made of uh, a given mass size, which determines the uh, changes of a given fish to escape through. So, the main the, the effort has been a huge effort has been made to to specify a given mass size or mm, a given mass geometry to allow the cod to escape through. So, after such efforts. Two codons are important or enforced nowadays in the Baltic Sea. One is the T90 codon, which is a codon with a specific geometry of the mesh opening, which fits with the round shape of of the of the cod of the of the, of this of the cod. And on the other side, uh, the Bacoma codon, which is basically a codon composed by two panels, the lower panel with a diamond mesh shape and the upper panel with a, again a square mesh shape to allow the cuts to go through. So uh, what's about flat face? Well, a few uh, effort has been paid for, for improving the, the escapement rates of flat faces. And we know that there is relevant difference between the round fish and the flat fish in terms of physiological and behavioral uh, characteristics that interacts with the probability to escape when the gear selectivity is uh, designed just for round fishes. So you can see in the lower uh, figures. Uh, the cuts escaping through the T90 column, the upper panel of the Bacoma column, and you can see here a flat face. Just this is commonly seen in your video footage how the body doesn't fit with the geometry of the uh, nettings um, designed for uh, round face escapements. So, in, in our opinion, specific approaches must be done to do the practice by catches, and this is what exactly have, we have been done during this year by developing and testing uh, what we call it a flat fish practice escape window or the fresh wing. The fresh wing uh, is basically a device uh, fitted to the in the front of the column to perform uh, a flat fish specific selection process. 
So it is composed by two grids here and here, which can be seen as escaping windows, and they have uh, they have um, been developed uh, based on inserting horizontal bar bars with a certain uh, bar spacing to to match with the uh, flatfish shape in normal swimming orientation. And the, the device is also uh, combines also a kind of obstacles in front of, of, of the grids to drive the fishes sideways and improve the contact likelihood with the, the windows. So basically what the aim is to uh, keep the catchability of the cuts, marketable cuts, above the minimum landing size, and at the same time allow most of flat pieces to scale. So it's a kind of a stepwise selection process where we face the selectivity of the flat pieces in the front of the column while we let the column to perform the selectivity of the, 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 the cut. So after the signing and build up the, the gear, we went before that. We need to specify, specify the, the bar spacing. The bar spacing of the windows, the press window, determines the me mechanical process of, of, of uh, short the pieces uh, conditioned to their length depend, uh, to the length size. So uh, to, 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 to set, to define such bar spacing, we use a special uh, protocol based on uh, lab experience. We mechanically uh, simulate the, 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 the selectivity process in the laboratory. We also gather information of, morpho of fish morphometrics and under such uh, information we produce uh, theoretical uh, selection parameters uh, using computer-based simulation tools. So at the end, and basically our target, we found that the optimal bar spacing for our for specific case would be a bar spacing of 38 millimeters. So after all, we went to the sea to uh, test this device. And we performed a number of 13 holes deployments with, the, with this experimental design. Uh, um, Juan, sorry, yeah. just a little time reminder. So that you're oh. already um, 16, 17 minutes, well, almost 18. <laughs> OK, OK, OK. okay so we 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 perform this twin troll experiment based on fishing in parallel two two gears one uh, with the, we call it the test with the with the first wind included and another the reference without uh, such device and the target was to estimate the rates of catch found in the test uh, by adding the the information of the I mean, to, to estimate the expected proportion of the total count of the total catch found in the test column, which allowed us to estimate the selectivity of the fresh wind. So this is a small video uh, recording where you can see um, the 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 mechanism, the selectivity mechanism of the fresh wind. You can see approaching flat faces, they contact the obstacles and they change the swimming orientation contacted directly to the to the windows and when that the bar spacing is sufficient why they escape through um, yes yeah, so this is uh, some results from this uh, experiment this is a uh, uh, these plots represent the catches for their by the reference code and the other panel represents the catches from the test column. You can see we we achieved the target to keep the cut catchability for 
individuals above minimum landing size, where we reduce, we reduce the catches of flat pieces in the, in the test column as well. So we also reduce, uh, we model the, the skip learn rate of the of the of the fresh wind by assessing the 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 um, the catch rate in the in the in the test year uh, using this model, which also allow us to estimate the selectivity parameters of of the fresh wind. We have obtained the uh, uh, L50, which means the probability, the land with probability of 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 50 percent uh, of retention of 32.90 percent and at 32.97 centimeters. So the next steps for optimization optimization of the press wing is to understand the underlying process affecting the land dependent scape likelihood. We know that there is uh, some um, some issues uh, in the select size selection process. We have to to understand, which is the the effect of the body contact mode. How how the the, the flat face contact the, the window is is an issue, which may that uh, condi uh, condition the the scheme likelihood. And also we have to uh, assess. If there is any land-dependent uh, behavior re re reaction to avoid the grid contact by the flat uh, we also are going to start tomorrow two uh, new crews to investigate uh, if altering the angle of attack of the grids may improve the escape rates. And uh, uh, the last step, when we got the optimal um, combination, we. Uh, our aim is to simplify the starting prototype into a simple specification to facilitate uh, the adoption of the device by the industry. So our aim was to is to provide the fisherman with a selective device uh, to avoid flat fish bycatch, which is a re relevant issue for the upcoming discard ban. And we found a 61% reduction in the flounder. Uh, Flatfish catches uh, that indicate that fresh wing is promising flatfish reduction to be used in the missile fisheries. Um, and that's all. Thank you. Okay. Um, thanks a lot, Juan. Um, I yeah. saw that some people got into. Oops. Okay. Wait a second so then I can. Okay, I saw that some people just join us at um, seven mainline um, time from the continent. So I have the feeling some people in the UK somehow mix up the timings. I hope, um, yeah, I'm really sorry. There's not much I can do, but nevertheless, the webinar will be uploaded to the YouTube channel. So then you for sure will be able to have a look at the presentations there. Um, then we've got a problem with the with the platform, so I don't know why we only have four minutes and a half left. So then, unless there's a quick question, but uh, I don't see any hands raised. Um, then I think probably I just gonna briefly, unfortunately, end the seminar. Um, if anyone has any questions, you can for sure look up for these guys online and direct them the questions or just email me and we will figure that out. Um, but before we finish, I'm just very worried that somehow we lost all the connections. connections. So I just want to make sure that um, you guys know that anyone is welcome to do webinars in this um, TEFA Tero Association. Uh, we have some plan already for next year. The first one will be in astrophysics and is entitled Astronomers in Germany and UK Research and Projects. Um, the, the second one is called Neuroscience Frontier Challenges for the uh, 2010. Uh, that will be done in March and is organized by Raul Delgado, which is the president of the PETFA. 
Um, next one will be in May, um, and it's called The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly uh, in Arthrosclerosis. So that's what it's about, Arthrosclerosis. But anyone is welcome to do this kind of seminar or webinar. Um, if anyone is interested on continuing with this oceanography, marine science, or focus it uh, a bit more into fisheries or whatever any other topic, just let me know and we can easily organize anything else. Uh, we have the platform ready and it can be used any day. So, yeah, just contact me if you're interested. Um, so then I will say that's it by now. I'm not sure if, uh, Enrique, you have anything else to say. Enrique is our organizer from the other co-organizer of the webinars, but I think so. <laughs> He's not saying that anything. So then, yeah, thank you also in the name of uh, everyone at uh, FERU and TERFA, the Association of Spanish Scientists in the UK and Germany. And thanks for having joined us today. Special thanks goes to the speakers today. So thank you.